still in session. Uh, the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 1427 in the name of Liam Kerr on the Michelle's Law campaign. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Liam Kerr to open the debate. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. What are the purposes of our justice system? Punishment of criminals, deterrence from criminal activity, and rehabilitation of those who have chosen to commit a crime are often suggested. But there are other aspects, including to protect the safety and welfare of the public, to protect the integrity of community and society, and to provide some kind of retribution, some closure for victims and their families. Too much focus has been on the first three aspects, those which relate to criminals, and we have lost focus on the victims. Presiding officer, Parliament heard earlier and is no doubt aware of an absolutely tragic set of circumstances which illustrate this point. Michelle Stewart lived in Drongen in Ayrshire. When she was only 17, John Wilson ended her life and took her away from her friends and family forever. Presiding officer, at this point, I would like to welcome that family to this parliament today and acknowledge their bravery and courage in being prepared to step forward. And I'm also pleased to welcome the Carson family, who we also heard about earlier, and likewise, I commend their bravery and courage. It is not appropriate to go into detail of this depraved attack. The facts have been rehearsed many times in the media. Suffice it to say that the sentence that Wilson received makes a mockery of the system. Now, my party has long been in favour of ensuring that life means life for the worst criminals, and I will be bringing forward a member's bill to do exactly that later this session, but that's for another time. Today we are here to ask why killers like John Wilson get out of prison only nine years into their 12-year sentence with no explanation or input given to the victim's family, with no consideration for their welfare and no restriction on the locations he can visit whilst he's out. Michelle's family think this is unacceptable. They are right. They demand three key reforms relating to the release of offenders from prison, both on a temporary basis and on parole. Firstly, that victims and their families must be given reasons for an offender's release and be able to make representations in person to those taking the decision. In practice, this means toughening up the victim not notification scheme. Now, Parliament will know that presently when the prison service or parole board decide to release a dangerous criminal back onto our streets, they are under no requirement to justify that to the public. Victims and families who are registered with the scheme simply receive a standard form letter which tells them the date the offender will be released. And there is no automatic right to make representations. The only recourse is a letter to the prison service or parole board. The one exception to that is when a so-called life sentence prisoner is being considered for release. The victim or family member may make representations in person. But be under no illusions. Those representations are not part of the parole hearing. The person they speak to will not be a member of the tribunal deciding on the case, and the right does not extend to temporary release decisions, only parole. And they don't carry a great deal of weight at all. Victims and families must no longer be shut out of decisions taken behind closed doors. They must be involved in a process that gives them a voice. The second demand is that the rights and welfare of the victims, the families, those impacted are explicitly taken into account by those taking the decisions to release offenders back into Scotland's communities. At present, Scottish prison service rules state that a governor must assess the risk that the prisoner may pose to the public at large before granting temporary release. Similarly, the Parole Board for Scotland looks at the protection of the public in general terms. Neither body is required to assess the impact that their decisions to release will have on the mental and physical well-being of individual victims and their families. And this cannot be right. Those, those who are most harmed, most wronged, most aggrieved by the criminal are not individually considered. And our justice system must surely be able to look victims in the eye and explain their decisions and take their thoughts, considerations, health and well-being into account. Now finally, exclusion zones. Both the parole board and the prison service already have the power to impose location restrictions when they release criminals from jail, but they are not using them. Why is this power 
not being used to stop offenders coming into contact with their victims. The answer from the authorities appears to be that allowing criminals back into their home communities helps the rehabilitation process. And that may be true. But are we really happy to prioritise criminals over victims in this way? Is there no point at which the rights of families to live safe and peaceful lives becomes more important? Michelle's family have spoken out powerfully about how seeing their daughter's murderer on their streets has affected them. Can any of us imagine how that must feel? How it must be to see this criminal swanning about the streets getting on with his life? Now, I well recall being consulted several times by a young constituent in my region on learning that the man who randomly dragged her off the street to rape her was to be released to the very community to the very streets where it happened. It destroyed any sense of safety, any sense of justice being done, and ultimately traumatized her beyond my understanding. Again. Presiding officer, this is not right. There simply must be greater use of exclusion zones on those offenders who are released. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. This measure requires no change in the law. Exclusion zones are a vital tool, and victims demand their use. So the message to those with the power Let's start using them. These are the three things that Michelle's law calls for. Each has the very clear aim of putting victims at the heart of the justice system, not left outside looking in. And I'm very grateful to others in this parliament for their cross-party support today and that they are here to contribute to this debate. On which note, I sought the views of other experts in this field. Dr. Marcia Scott, CEO of Scottish Women's Aid, told me how often domestic abuse survivors voice concerns about their safety when their abusers are released from prison. They tell of decisions to house the perpetrator taken without consideration of the impact that this may have on the women and children. And Victim Support Scotland told me they are encouraged by discussions on how to include victims and witness during the parole process. The Cabinet Secretary for Justice has, since taking over this brief, exhibited a commendable willingness to listen and take good ideas on board. And I hope that continues because the simple fact is that Michelle's family and others like them up and down the country need more than words. They need action. So let's be clear, this campaign is not about preventing criminals ever being released from prison. It is not about preventing rehabilitation, nor is it about excluding criminals from society. No, it is a simple desire to tip the balance in favor of the victim, their families and those who have been wronged, and to treat them with the dignity and respect they deserve. Presiding officer, it is time to put victims first. It is time to refocus the debate away from criminals. And it is time for Michelle's law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I say before we move into the open debate, and I say this very, very gently, that we do not permit applause from the public area. I perfectly understand why it's done, but we don't permit it. Uh, I now move to the open debate and I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Johnson. Thank please. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by apologising both to you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and to fellow members for having to leave this debate early due to a long-standing event that I have in my diary that I am hosting. But can I also begin by thanking Liam Kerr for bringing forward, I think, what is a very important debate to this chamber, because I think it raises some very important issues about how we deal with important issues in our criminal justice system of transparency, punishment and parole. I would also like to give my thanks to Michelle Stewart's family who deserve so much credit for their activism and uh, raising the issues in the way that they have because it stems from deep personal tragedy and I know that I and everyone else in this chamber will have our thoughts uh, and con deepest condolences as we speak on these issues through this debate. I believe that the system can only be strengthened through open discussion of these issues. The justice system often seems to treat victims as a, an afterthought. Its logic and decisions opaque, its behavior seemingly cold and unsympathetic. I think we can do better. I think we must do better. But as we think on these issues, we must also uphold the values of justice. Justice must be swift, justice must be fair, and justice must be consistent. The blindfold worn by Lady Justice is just as important as the sword and the scales that she holds. But what we cannot allow to happen is that Lady Justice is also deaf to the, the, the concerns, the views and the interests of the victim. And I think that is what we are seeking to discuss. 
Now, much of Michelle's law campaign centres around two key themes, victims' rights to be heard and transparency. And I'd like to discuss some issues around that latter point because I think this is a key issue and it's something that I've been actively talking to those in the criminal justice system about transparency and how we can have greater understanding of the workings of justice. Because I've long believed that the way we sentence those convicted and the way that that is reported does not lead to strong understanding of the sentence itself. And I think that's a fundamental problem with our system. Sentences, in my view, should reflect three things that society hopes to achieve when we sentence convicted criminals. First of all, we must deal with the root causes of the crime. For example, addiction, involvement with organised crime. Secondly, we must punish because those who have committed crime must pay and atone for what they have done. And we must also rehabilitate, ensuring that, measure, that a measured and safe re-entry into society. So those are the three aims. And I think if sentences were handed out explicitly with those three aims and explicitly reported in those, two term, those terms, then we would be making some progress. I think, in short, and if I can put it flippantly, we need a Ron Seal approach to sentencing. Sentences have to do what they say in the tin. And at the moment, because we have automatic release after two thirds of a sentence served, I think we have a degree of confusion. Now, I'm not arguing for necessarily an increase in sentences, but I think it has to be clear how much time will be served, how much time will be served in those three core elements so that we can avoid the misleading um, understanding of what will happen and avoid the mistrust that I think that uh, imbues in our criminal justice system. But I'd also like to talk about victim notification because I think these, there are important uh, points to be raised here. I think it is right that we improve the, the, the victim's understanding of when uh, people will be released and how they will be released. But we also need to look at the constraints within that, partly through data protection and through other principles. It's right that the prison service tells when prisoners will be released. But we also must ask, how, you know, can we say when they might be out, where, and what activity they might be doing? The, the data protection is one issue, but we also have an important principle that once you have done your time, that you should have the opportunity to rejoin society. So I think when you think carefully about how to balance the rights of victims of their family, because this is hugely important, but we must also preserve the hope of rehabilitation which is an important component of our criminal justice system. And I'll conclude there, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by John Scott. Mr. Scott will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms. McGuire, please. Um, at the outset, I wish to express my heartfelt sympathy to Michelle Stewart's family and the Carsons. I'm very sorry for your loss and the, and the pain that you're enduring. Presiding officer, I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to Liam Kerr's debate on Michelle's law and thank him for bringing the important topic of strengthening victims' rights to the Chamber. I support the Scottish Government's focus on prevention, early intervention and services that support rehabilitation and ultimately reduce reoffending. Those things do make our communities safer. However, for a justice system to be truly just, the needs of the victims must be at the heart. And I share the feeling of campaigners that the voice of victims need to be better heard. I would agree that the distinct safety and welfare of victims and their families has to not only be considered, but acted on. And I would add that this needs to happen at all stages of the criminal justice process. Providing more help and support for victims of crime and witnesses is key to building a better criminal justice system. Navigating the justice system would be daunting at any time. At times of trauma and loss, it must be even more so. It's imperative that in making law and policy, we recognise the real life impact on people and never lose sight of that. I want to acknowledge the work that has been done and the progress that has been made in our justice system in Scotland. However, in the context of this debate, which follows a very specific tragedy, I'm not gonna stand here and, and list them on this occasion. What I will say is that moving forward, what we'll all have to do on a cross-party basis in this parliament is work together and be cognizant of what evidence tells us effectively reduces crime and reoffending, and makes our communities in Scotland safer. 
I reiterate my belief that victims and their families must be considered at all stages of the criminal justice process, and this consideration must not end with sentencing. Presiding officer, I note in the Scottish Government's programme for government as part of ongoing reforms, the Scottish Government say they will strengthen victims' rights and support. And there's a commitment to increase the openness and transparency of the parole system. This is a welcome development and in closing, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to take the opportunity to expand on that commitment a bit and share with us and uh, members of the, the gallery and his summing up at the end of the debate exactly what that will mean for victims and their families. Thank you, Ms McGuire. Call John Scott, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by congratulating Liam Kerr on securing uh, this debate on Michelle's Law uh, today and so early in the parliamentary year. Can I also welcome the Stuart family to our public gallery today, knowing, as I do, how difficult it is for them to again relive and recall the circumstances of Michelle's death. And I salute their courage in doing so today and also welcome the Carson family as well. Presiding officer, when my constituent Lisa Stewart first contacted me on the 25th of June 2018 about the murder of her sister Michelle by John Wilson in 2008, I was horrified to hear of the circumstances surrounding her death and the premeditated attack on her which cost Michelle her life. Her murderer John Wilson was sentenced to 16 years imprisonment for this heinous crime and this sentence was reduced to 12 years as he pled guilty immediately to killing schoolgirl Michelle. This initial reduction of 25% in the sentence was a source of dismay to the victim's family, but one they had to accept. However, presiding officer, you can only imagine Michelle's parents, brother and sister's anger when they discovered on the 23rd of June that John Wilson would be walking the streets of Ayrshire, possibly of Ayr, on unsupervised home leave, just nine years after murdering his victim, Michelle. As we know, Ruth Davidson raised this matter with the First Minister on the 28th of June, which resulted in the First Minister giving instruction to our new Cabinet Secretary, Hamza Yusuf, to meet with the Stuarts to discuss their concerns. And this meeting took place on the 3rd of August at Russell House in Ayr, with commitments given by the Cabinet Secretary that the family's concerns would be listened to and addressed. And having attended that meeting with the Stuarts, I heard these commitments being given to them. So imagine again, presiding officer, the Stuarts family's unhappiness on Tuesday when the First Minister in our programme of government made only a passing reference really to what her government is prepared to do to recognise the rights of victims in circumstances similar to the Stuart family. Because, presiding officer, since this matter was first raised in Parliament by Ruth Davidson, two other families have contacted me in similar dreadful circumstances. And this highlights for me the widespread nature of concerns of hard-working, decent families such as the Stuarts, such as any of us who find themselves victims of crime through no fault of their own. So today the Scottish Government must really take heed of these families' concerns and change their attitude towards the families of murder victims and victims more generally in the Scottish justice system. As Liam Kerr had said, the rights of victims are almost an afterthought in Scots law as it stands. And I want to hear on behalf of victims in Scotland less about the rights of criminals less about the rights of offenders and hear more said about the rights of victims and victims having more say in the justice system. So we need to see more and better use of exclusion zones for released offenders to stop them coming into contact with victims and victims' families. We need to see families having more input into prison service and parole board decisions and a more sympathetic and understanding approach taken by authorities towards the fears and needs of families. No longer is it sufficient in the modern interconnected world, everyone's on Facebook or WhatsApp, for victims and families of victims to be told effectively to man up, 
and just get on with life because it's I been this way. Because presiding officer, families such as the Stuarts and others and victims of many other dreadful crimes will always be and will remain the victims. While offenders and criminals and yes, murderers walk free after serving their sentence, the families of those who have lost ones never recover. No matter how strong and how supportive the Stuarts are of each other, and no matter how much support they receive from their families and friends and their local communities, not a day will pass that they don't think of Michelle. So, presiding officer, today this parliament again asks the Scottish Government to bring about the changes to the legislation the Stuarts and Scottish Conservatives are seeking. I hope the Cabinet Secretary will now act to bring these changes about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. And I'll call on Hamza Yusuf to close the Government. Cabinet Secretary, please. <coughs> thank you. Uh, Presiding Officer, can I thank Liam Kerr for bringing this important debate uh, to the Chamber and those who have signed uh, his motion. Can I welcome the Carson family uh, and also Michelle Stewart's family, who I had the great pleasure of meeting in August, though all of us will have wished it wouldn't have been in these particular circumstances. Um, it was, for me, uh, presiding officer, a really moving uh, meeting, uh, in one sense inspirational, I'll come to that in, in, in a second, uh, but also very powerful and affected me, and certainly still does, but certainly affected me uh, for a, a number of uh, days and weeks uh, after that meeting. First of all, before I, I go into the, the substance uh, of, of this debate, and I think it's been a very good debate with very good contributions, and, and my job will be to give as many reassurances uh, and, 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 and tell you about some of the action we'll be taking. But before I do that, uh, Presiding Officer, one of the reasons why I found the meeting uh, very powerful was that I actually got to learn a little bit more about Michelle. So often, unfortunately, uh, when these uh, terrible and uh, tragic murders, homicides uh, happen, uh, for those that did not know the family, uh, we'll pick up a newspaper or see a, a news broadcast and we'll see a picture and all will be associated with that individual is that terrible uh, murder. So I wanted to know about the person behind that story. Uh, and, and, and Michelle Stewart's family, I, I got to meet uh, Father Kenny, uh, uh, Josephine Stewart, uh, Lisa was there, Kenneth uh, and Stephen, uh, and as well as John Scott, uh, MSP. Uh, and, and each of the family members took it in turn to tell me uh, about Michelle and what was so inspirational about her uh, was that she came, uh, overcame so much adversity personally uh, in terms of some of the physical health issues uh, that she had uh, and she never let any of that uh, hold her back. So a, a life lost far, far, far too young. Uh, and uh, you know, just hearing about her for me was, was incredibly important because behind every single one, uh, unfortunately, of, of, of the homicides, uh, the murders that we see, uh, unfortunately, in Scotland, there, there is a human story and none of us, none of us, whether it's myself as the cabinet secretary or indeed any of us uh, uh, across the chamber, none of us should forget uh, the importance of the human behind that tragedy. Um, from day one, uh, presiding officer of, of, of me taking up the role as cabinet secretary for justice, uh, I've made it clear that victims' rights must be strengthened at the heart of our criminal justice system. And a programme for government commitments, which this week the First Minister has been speaking about, reflect this and I'll come to those later but I want to get straight into the substance of the Michelle Law campaign, Michelle's Law uh, campaign. The reason why I said the meeting with the Stuart family was inspirational was because I don't think any single one of us, none of us, would have taken any offence or would have been entirely, uh, you know, none of us would have been surprised at all if the Stuart family, after suffering such a tragedy as they did, chose to simply reflect on and overcome their individual grief that all of them were facing. None of us would have faulted them for doing that. But they didn't choose to do that. The reason why they're inspirational as a family is because they chose and are choosing to ensure that out of this tragedy comes a positive legacy, which is the Michelle's Law uh, campaign. Uh, and that's why I say it's inspirational. So let me praise them for that campaign. Let me also give them some... Uh, reassurances uh, around uh, the, the campaign and how we are not only listening to them, uh, not only giving them uh, warm words, but how there will be some concrete action of that, I can guarantee you, uh, and I'll come to that uh, in just a second. Um, I met with them and uh, the family in, in early August, 
and uh, now we're a month later uh, into early September. And I can promise them that what they had to say to me at that meeting profoundly influenced what was in this year's programme for government. That direct conversation with the family, the follow-up uh, with the family, with the MSPs uh, involved, that directly influenced uh, what was in the programme for government. I'll touch upon some of that uh, in a minute. One of the asks, and, and, and Liam Cairn, is uh, opening remarks came, uh, spoke about the, the, the three main asks. Uh, one of them, for example, was the victims and families of victims in this case, um, that the, the reason for a perpetrator being released on, 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 on release, um, that, that, that those reasons are given, and that toughen up the victim notification scheme. Can I say to Liam Kerr, and more importantly, if he doesn't mind me saying to the Stewart family, that, that I'm absolutely happy to commit to doing that, and that very much is part of the, the, the conversation uh, that we're going to be having post-PFG. The First Minister announced, as he knows, the consultation that will be held before the end of the year. And look, I will try to speed that up uh, as appropriately as I can uh, into the handling of parole. That will very much include consideration of the issues raised, raised by the Michelle's Law Campaign. I can give you an absolute 100% guarantee here that that consultation will address uh, some, of the, some of the issues raised uh, specifically on, on parole in Michelle's Law campaign, including, for example, the reasoning for decisions, the opportunity for victims and the families of victims to contribute to decision making. So I want to give them, and, and, and as I say, more importantly, I feel Michelle Stewart's family, that assurance that that will be part of the consultation. And I know that can be frustrating as, as, as legislators uh, and lawmakers. We understand the process that we have to go through in terms of consultation and drafting up the legislation, the stage one, stage two, and stage three of those debates. And, and, and it can be infuriating for, for those uh, that are outside of this chamber. Uh, but I promise them that, that there'll be no time wasted uh, in terms of uh, taking that uh, and taking those measures uh, forward. Uh, the second uh, point that um, was raised uh, by uh, Liam Cairn as part of the, uh, the campaign is the rights of victims uh, taken, uh, the rights of victims and families of victims when it comes to temporary release. Uh, once again, I'm very happy uh, to commit uh, to ensuring that the victims uh, and the families of victims in this case, that their uh, contributions are taken in uh, and their issues, their circumstances, the way they live, where they work, so on and so forth, that these are taken into consideration as they already should be. And I should say that in my letter to uh, Michelle Stewart's family, which I referenced in, in, an early, uh, in, in First Minister's questions, um, that very much uh, the, the, the Scottish Prison Service are, carefully, are themselves carefully considering how to improve the information and support that are avail is available to victims and, and indeed families. Uh, and this will include how to better engage with families at various critical points in sentencing. That came out very strongly in the meeting that John Scott uh, was at, uh, and we'll take back, and SPS will take that back and reflect upon that. But also, uh, they will look and reflect on how the victims and the families of victims' circumstances and individual circumstances are taken into account uh, in relation to temporary release. So that was the second point, which again, I'm happy to commit uh, to exploring, and, and when I say exploring, there is not a lack of concrete action. He will understand, Liam Kerr will, will certainly understand this, uh, that there are complexities uh, within uh, all of these issues that we discussed. They are not easy. These are the most difficult issues that we have to deal with. There are complexities, and I have to ensure from my perspective that when it comes to the complexities, uh, that I'm not doing something that can make the situation worse as opposed to better, because all of us have, uh, I believe, the same outcome. But Please do not, and I say this to the family uh, directly, please do not confuse that or conflate that uh, with an unwillingness to listen to what you have to say and to act as best we possibly can uh, to ensure that Michelle's law campaign and, and the issues that you raise are taken forward as quickly as possible. And the last point, and I'm aware I'm slightly over time, presenting officer, but the, the last point um, I wish to raise is around the exclusion zones, the, the third point in, in, in Michelle's law campaign. And Liam Kerr's language from the beginning of the Michelle's law campaign to, to now has slightly developed, and I think that's a welcome development because uh, he, he understands that there, are, uh, there is the possibility uh, to, to, to have uh, conditions uh, put upon uh, an, an offender's release in relation to uh, who he or she can see, where he or she can go. Uh, his ask is, how do these get used more? Uh, how can these be used more? Uh, and again, I go back to my point that I made just a second ago uh, around complexities, uh, but uh, the powers are possibly there, are, are there, 
uh, what I will do is I will give an absolute commitment, and I can tell him, actually, right here, right now, that that is something that can be looked at. It will be something that it is something that will be looked at. Um, but, of course, we'll have to work with local authority uh, partners, and I give way to, to John Scott. John Scott. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I hear what you say, and, I, and I'm assured that your intentions are absolutely um, of the first order. However, can you give us some indication of time scale um, for these um, changes to be made or, or guidance, different guidance to be issued? Please. Cabinet Secretary. Can, can I say, in, in terms of the, the, the earlier points, the consultation we're aiming for is, is the end of the year, but I'll try to, 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 to really put some pace and inject some pace into that as quickly as I can. In terms of the exclusion zones uh, and so on and so forth, I, I'm not able to give them a time zone because we a time scale because we have, uh, of course, currently the powers exist. Uh, what we're looking to do is to see how they can be potentially used wider, uh, how can they be extended, how can they be strengthened. And I'll give him the absolute assurance that there won't be any hesitation in doing that. In fact, it was that very day that I met with the family of Michelle Stewart that we started to be, you know, to, to, to look into this issue with even more pace once the Michelle's Law campaign uh, became public on, on, on that very day. So we're wasting no time on that. But what I can give John's got a promise on uh, is that I will keep him and, of course, the family and other members who are interested in this absolutely up to speed. And the very last point, and again, I, I apologise, presiding officer, because I'm over time, was a point that I thought was made by, by Daniel Johnson, who I know had to go, uh, and a very, very thoughtful contribution. And I just want to end on, on, on this point, um, that there is often in our political narrative a, 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 a seeming to be a tension between the, between the rights of victims and the families of victims uh, and the rehabilitation of offenders. And some of that came out in some of the contributions earlier on uh, today. And while I completely understand how, how, how that perception uh, might exist, I think it's important for us in the positions that we're in to say very clearly that the two are not mutually exclusive, that there's not necessarily a tension between the two. Because if you do rehabilitate offenders, and the reason why we rehabilitate offenders, of course, is to ensure that we have less victims of crime in the first place, that we have fewer victims of crime in the first place, is that we are no longer uh, having to deal with uh, uh, more and more victims. In fact, uh, of course, we want to see crime uh, go down. So I, I would just say that we should never lose focus of both of these. But I hear exactly what the family say, certainly, uh, and even what opposition members say, that um, you know, victims' rights uh, must be strengthened at the heart of our justice system. And I can give everybody uh, an absolute and unequivocal assurance uh, that that will be the case uh, so long as I'm uh, the Cabinet Secretary of Justice, certainly under this, this current Scottish uh, Government, and I look forward, uh, I think, uh, hopefully uh, shortly after this members debate meeting with the, the Stuart family uh, and giving them those reassurances as best I possibly can. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And uh, before I close the debate, I'm sure that members sitting in the Chamber have heard the debate and have not been contributing, wish to extend their condolences to the family. This is a very tough road you've taken, uh, but it seems to be taking you to some results, um, though we'll never compensate by any means whatsoever. I, um, that concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament and suspend it till 2.30. I have to say something like that. I'm going to start through that.